Hi everyone and welcome to the webinar. Cisco accelerates app development with OpenShift, Red Hat's POS. Before we get started with today's presentation, there are a few items to quickly mention. You should see a taskbar at the bottom of your screen. Each icon is assigned to a particular element of today's webinar. If you're not sure what the icon does, hover over the icon with your mouse and a box will appear to tell you the function. Also, below the slides window you should see a blank ask a question box that allows you to type the question. After you type the question, click Submit to send it to our presenter. Feel free to submit your questions throughout the webinar, and our presenter will address as many as possible following the presentation. You can submit any technical questions related to the webinar platform here. Please close down other browser windows or applications that might be splitting your bandwidth, including VPNs, as these might interfere with the audio or video stream. If you experience any connectivity issues, please refresh your browser. Today's session is being recorded, and all registrants will receive an email within one to two days of the event with a link to view this presentation on demand. So now I'm going to hand it over to today's speakers, Dan and Sandeep. Okay, thank you, Nick, and thanks, everybody, for joining our webinar today. Uh, we have an exciting guest speaker today. We have Sandeep Puri, engineering architect with Cisco. Um, and Sandeep is going to talk about how Cisco has adopted uh, Red Hat's OpenShift Enterprise platform as a service offering, and they're using it internally within Cisco to accelerate application development. My name is Dan Jungst, and I lead the marketing efforts for the OpenShift business unit within Red Hat. And so I will be serve as moderator today. Uh, but the bulk of the conversation will be from Sandeep, and, and we'll hear directly about how they're leveraging OpenShift. Um, Cisco has uh, added the OpenShift technology to its mix of technology to really provide uh, a rapid mechanism for providing web scale applications and frameworks. Um, they've adopted platform as a service uh, because of the, some of the key characteristics that it brings with it. Uh, for example, has it provides a great focus for the developer experience, giving the developers self-service access to the technologies they need. Uh, it's got a multi-tenant container technology within it for super high efficiency. Um, and it's got robust security based on the Red Hat Enterprise Linux platform that it's built on. And it's allowing Cisco to really move to a DevOps model without really impacting the business in any way, but rather accelerating the business. So in this session, Sandeep is going to talk about the, uh, some of the uh, environment that they had, the challenges that they faced, um, and that they wanted to solve with PaaS, and then how, about how OpenShift aligned with their needs and how it fits into their architecture and some of the key lessons learned. So Sandeep, thanks for joining us today, and welcome to the webinar. Uh, at this point, I'll turn it over to you, and you can uh, take us through the conversation. Thanks, Dan. Um, my name is Sandeep Puri. I'm an engineering architect at Cisco. Um, I will be talking through um, our PaaS um, efforts and how we got to where we are today with OpenShift. Um, the talk is actually um, partitioned into two halves, sort of. The first half we'll be talking about um, who we are, um, where PaaS fits into our um, journey, the, the architectural tenets around how we um, intended to do PaaS and um, at the end, how we ended up choosing OpenShift for some of the past capabilities that we have, and then briefly talk about some of the takeaways that we have. So um, Cisco IT Infrastructure Services is, is responsible for um, creating and maintaining the stack where applications are developed at Cisco. Um, currently, cities is the acronym for Cisco IT Infrastructure Services. They're responsible for the infrastructure as a service components inside um, Cisco IT, as well as the platform as a service components inside IT. And we started our journey with um, infrastructure as a service and moved on to platform as a service. Um, and Cities is specifically focused on delivering um, application development environments and infrastructure services in a, in a cloud delivery model. So um, a brief overview of the components that CITES or Cisco IT infrastructure services um, comprises of um, the front end that actually manages the ordering of services that you can order from Cisco IT. It's a self-service catalog using Cisco's prime service catalog. Um, there's an orchestration element that actually talks to different um, res what we call resource managers, and the resource managers could be 
um, anything um, from your phone provisioning systems to your um, cloud management systems and so on. And in this context, uh, the PaaS management systems like OpenShift become one of the resource managers. And all of these are residing on um, um, Cisco's um, hardware, so to speak. So um, Cisco IT and CDs is responsible for providing environments that support uh, more than 5,000 developers. Currently today, um, we have an existing PaaS-like platform with uh, more than 30,000 JVM in instances, all hosting applications developed internally by Cisco IT, uh, ranging from um, custom applications to uh, doing HR functions or any of the other IT functions, all the way to uh, package the ERP applications that reside on um, these infrastructures. These um, environments or infrastructures also support all the deployments and environment uh, life cycles and environments to support these applications, including dev, test, stage, and prod. Um, this environment or these sets of environments are responsible for um, uh, more than $30 billion worth of transactions flowing through, and they have to be available 24 by 7 globally and supported globally. So um, just a brief overview of what Cisco IT uh, provides. Now, moving on to our past journey, so I wanted to briefly talk about the kind of clients that um, Cisco IT typically deals with on, on the IT infrastructure side. The first or the third set of clients, I, I'll start from client number three. The th third set of clients are folks who actually just need the IaaS level services where they say, give me VM storage and network, and that's all you need to provide SLAs for. I will build things that I need on top of it. So sort of the um, um, cloud IaaS models that you have in the, in the public cloud. The second set of clients, client number two, actually say, you know, give me um, the VM and IaaS level resources, but um, sorry, um, but um, uh, provide me PaaS or, or manage resources if you can, and I'll mix the two workloads and and um, you know provide my SaaS services. And the first set of clients actually say, I don't really need to worry about VMs and storage and network and so on. You manage that. You provide a higher level service like a managed application environment. I'll just you know consume that and create my applications that way. And we have to cater to all three types. Um, as I mentioned, we started from the client number three bucket, um, and as we move on higher up the stack, we're moving towards the client number one bucket. And we believe if we can enable our developers to focus on the development side of things. Um, most of our client needs will be fulfilled by client number one, and that's where the PaaS efforts come in. So with that in mind, we actually started down, what do we want from um, our PaaS environments? And we, we call, call our PaaS environment um, lightweight application environment. Again, uh, we already have a limited um, uh, PaaS-like environment today, and it's been there for um, seven plus years. Uh, limited in the sense it has some cloud character characteristics, but the scale is pretty large, as I was saying, 30,000 JVMs. But we wanted to um, expand the cloud-like capabilities of that environment. And these are sort of the um, high-level criteria that we wanted um, in, in, from that environment. So the first one was a limit, uh, moving from a limited uh, or a restricted set of choices for developers to use to a flexibility of choices. So Every language runtime that we build in our previous environment, it takes anywhere from six to nine months to kind of bring in that capability and make it GA, right? So uh, it's very expensive. It was very expensive for us to create a new environment for every runtime. Run so we wanted a, an environment that actually provided uh, adding capabilities easily out of the box. The second one was, um, you know, moving from closed source um, um, providers of, of the software to an open source ecosystem as much as possible. And, and to us, uh, 
it, it was a no-brainer. We've, we've been using open source quite a bit, but there's a mix of open source and uh, commercial software in our stack today. Uh, we're just trying to move more and more towards the uh, open source side. The third aspect was um, the provisioning lead times um, should be as small as possible so that um, you can actually move towards a self-serve model where clients actually come in and just click a few buttons, uh, provide the information that we require to give them an environment, and everything is automated as much as possible. So that's the end state that um, clients themselves uh, helps, help themselves, right? So they shouldn't be sending um, queue requests to queues and somebody steps in and fulfills the provisioning request. The fourth one is um, something that I, I think all enterprises struggle with. Um, we wanted a, uh, an environment that at least provided a framework for full application lifecycle management. What I mean by that is a developer starting from you know the initial provisioning of um, an application to deploying an application and before deploying, developing, testing, and um, going through the QA cycle, and then actually going live production. All of that, there should be either hooks provided by the framework to, to help enable a one-stop shop for all of those actions, or provide the actions, um, you know, provide a solution for the entire um, um, life cycle itself. And the last piece that we were looking for is the framework that we choose for the PaaS uh, environment should allow us to scale from hundreds of applications to tens of thousands of applications. It doesn't necessarily mean that uh, Cisco will be hosting tens of thousands of applications. It means that if we ever need to, we should need to go scramble and figure out a different environment for that. And um, you know, the same framework should allow for large memory footprint applications as well as microservices. And microservices and micro applications are, are the types of applications that will probably, um, you know, increase the number of applications to tens of thousands. So with that framework in mind, we actually came up with uh, a set of criteria that we um, use to choose what framework um, we should be um, implementing at Cisco. Um, I won't talk over all of the blocks. I will talk, however, about the section. So uh, at the bottom, you'll see um, things like open source, polyglot, on-prem builder, and so on. So these were the bu uh, criteria buckets that we used to kind of look at different types of PaaS frameworks out there, whether they were fully managed or, or build your own PaaS kind of things, and, and we decided on, um, for example, OpenShift based on these um, criteria. So open source, I already talked about. There's benefits to it and so on. Polyglot was a big one for us where um, it's not just the languages, the, the different kinds of languages, the frameworks you support, but also application frameworks, database engines, and um, it should be, you know, uh, IaaS agnostic, it should be able to run on um, any kind of IaaS that you have, whether it's a public cloud or a private cloud. Uh, On-prem and off-prem were complementary to each other, in the sense, at least for us, in the sense we should be able to host our own PaaS uh, environment using the framework that we choose, but also if ever required, whether it's for business viability reasons or, or for, um, you know, burst cloud bursting, we should be able to burst out, uh, for example, to an off-prem or a cloud-hosted provider without having to change our code bits, right? Um, and the, the middle pieces here, builder, provider, subscriber, are sort of roles that we think we should uh, have in a cloud-like environment. We typically care about only the provider and the subscriber. The provider provides the resources and subscriber use them. There's a third category called the builder, where the builder actually adds capabilities that the provider can take and provide as services, right? So that that builder category is fairly new, but it's it's crucial that we kind of separate that out. The provider is not always the one that builds the capabilities. And so with that roles and the other characteristics that we had in mind, um, it seemed to us that OpenShift, even though it did not have 
all of the blocks in uh, in all of these uh, categories, that was the direction it was moving in. It, so it, it, in essence, it, it filled the mold that we had in mind for a cloud-based PaaS environment fairly well. And, and that's why we uh, ended up choosing OpenShift to kickstart our PaaS. Now, um, some of the things that we wanted to um, ensure while um, building out our PaaS environment, uh, our lightweight application environment, um, is what I'm going to be talking about. Um, there's three or four, four or five architectural tenets and aspirations, and I'll, I'll be walking through them now. So the first one was um, cities, as I talked about, um, created this data center transformation trend uh, in Cisco, and you'll see this probably in other uh, um, IT shops as well, where using uh, virtualization and automation actually brought the TCO uh, of uh, a host down quite a bit, right? And, and the end-to-end -end provisioning times down quite a bit, and the virtualization rate went up. And this trend has been continuing for a while now, and this, this is a published slide from um, our um, Global Infrastructure Services in Cisco IT. The intent here was not, um, not to stop the trend. So when we do pass, continue the trend that IaaS had and, and try to bring down the TCO for an, uh, running an application even further down. And, and um, you know, the end-to-end the -end provisioning, instead of days, it should be minutes. And, and so that was the architectural trend that we started with. The second aspect of it was um, around the, the notion of uh, a resource model that application developers can work with. Um, and what we mean by a resource model is different application teams may have different requirements for life cycles of applications. Uh, for, for regional availability of applications, they may need to have applications hosted in one data center for one app and maybe three diff different data centers for another app. So they should be able to um, define their own life cycles, uh, define how many, uh, how much resources they will um, be consuming from from uh, LAE, and also defining their resiliency posture that way. So you know whether it's uh, regional or global, um, and also have, provide application continuous application um, build and deployment. Um, some applications may want to use um, thing tools like Jenkins and so on. Some application teams may have their own um, build systems, but LAE should be able to provide an environment that caters to almost all of these um, aspects, right? The third aspect was around um, the notion of, you know, containers for applications. Up to now, we've been okay, or, or the industry has been okay with using virtual machines as a port, sort of a de facto portable container for applications. Um, and it provides a few things that you see in the slide here. What we wanted to get to was, in order to get to that, the same framework provides um, a cheap and, and fairly efficient way to host hundreds of applications and scaling all the way up to hundreds of thousands. We needed to get to a, another stage where VMs by themselves were not enough. Um, you needed to use containers, uh, and uh, most of our applications are typically either written in in uh, in languages like Java, which um, sort of are are agnostic of the of the runtime of the OS, or in things like Ruby, PHP, which can work similarly across different OSs, right? So, um, and most of our OSs seem to be um, Linux, and and containers kind of fit that bill where you could have efficiency, but also have a way to package the application, sort of like a VM, but um, a much smaller and much more efficient. So that's, we, we thought that this is the route we should be taking on, um, as far as building the platforms go. The last aspect of it was, it's not just the application hosting environment that, um, application developers care about. It's actually the entire process uh, of how you deploy, develop an application. Um, and don't pay it too, too much attention to the different um, icons in this slide. What this is trying to show is 
that when you do, uh, provide an application uh, development and runtime environment, you have to cater to all six aspects or more aspects of application development, right? So it's starting from planning to developing to source code management to continuous building, um, automated testing, deployment, and, re uh, and release, and then adapting and scaling. So even though in this aspect, uh, OpenShift, for example, is at the tail end of it where you can actually host um, your development staging and production. The OpenShift is where applications actually reside, but there's an ecosystem of tools that um, we'll have to um, integrate with OpenShift, um, or, open, or vice versa. Vice, uh, OpenShift will have to integrate with uh, uh, an ecosystem of these tools, right? Um, and this is a, this is a snapshot of one type of um, application lifecycle management that certain groups may be able to use. So in this case, um, a development environment in OpenShift will be used to develop applications. You can use uh, Git and um, commit and, and so on to push your code, and a, a Jenkins build server will will pick it up and, and run the test through. After it passes the test, it, it's, it releases the binaries itself or, or um, the fully tested source code to an artifact repository, which will then deploy the code to a production environment using uh, the development or the deployment pipelines like Urban Code. And in this case, it'll, it'll be using the binary deployment uh, pieces of OpenShift. Um, so this is just to show that it's not just your development and runtime environment. You have to think about, um, or we have to think about the larger ecosystem of tools. So with that, um, this actually brings the first half of the um, of the presentation to a close. Now I'll switch gears to sort of the technical architecture of LAE and what we came up with our uh, for our first release and then and talk about some of the roadmap items um, after that. So uh, in summary, um, some of the integration um, Enterprise integration um, that we did with OpenShift at Cisco was um, an integrated ordering if experience. So Cisco actually has a product that Cisco IT uses called Prime Service Catalog, which is a front end for um, all services that um, Cisco IT's clients use. So you could be ordering IaaS uh, cloud resources. You could be ordering your phones. You could be ordering anything that typically uh, a, a um, IT person or IT client would order from, and this is a front single front end that uh, captures the order and um, you know, uses orchestration tools to call the right resources at the end. Um, so we had to make sure that we integrated with that. Um, we had to make sure that there was single sign-on or enterprise single sign-on between our portals and the OpenShift system. Um, we had to ensure. Even though in a cloud model we want to get to um, secured, a security posture where the application itself defines what the, what the security posture should be, there's still a, a bit of, I would, I would say, maybe legacy um, architectures around you know, internal and external zones, and we had to bake that support in um, to ease the migration of current applications that are residing in other environments. And so we had to make sure OpenShift, our deployment OpenShift, at, at least had that notion built in, right? Uh, we're a pretty big ERP shop uh, in a sense. Um, there's enterprise databases that we have. Um, and we had to ensure that there were drivers and so on available, uh, in this case for Oracle, from OpenShift so that applications developed in OpenShift automatically have that driver available. Um, the, the other aspect of you know application development and, and runtime management of the applications is around the analytics of um, of things that are spewed out by applications. So logging you know, from the application itself or logging from the from the framework that supports the application. So we use Splunk to to aid in our analytics, and it's not just application code. It could be um, you know data from from the network devices to the compute devices. So all of those are available in, in, in 
Splunk and their um, new environments are being added to Splunk, we had to make sure that OpenShift was integrated well with Splunk as well so that we could have a holistic view of, at a, at a given uh, moment in time, we could have a holistic view of what is going on with, with uh, a particular flow, for example, for an application. Um, the, uh, the second last piece is uh, we have a pretty big uh, in enterprise integration biz, um, environment using web, so, uh, web services gateway and, and um, typical ESB services. We have to ensure that OpenShift work well with, with that integration bus. And then the last piece, as I talked about earlier, was how do you deliver code from to your dev environment, from your dev to your state, to your QA, and finally to production, and maybe in multiple data centers. So we had to make sure we had that integration in there. So um, this is sort of a very high-level architecture diagram of, of um, LAE, our lightweight application environment. What this is showing is OpenShift um, in the box in the middle with uh, surrounded by red, and then all of the other pieces that we added to the mix to make sure that it met our needs. So um, we added our own reverse proxy and um, load balancing on top of what OpenShift provides, and we have our global site selector set up so that um, proximity-based um, direction of um, DNS-based direction of um, requests would get to the right data centers and so on. We integrated a single sign-on with OpenShift. Um, in this case, we had to work with the, the Apaches that front end, both the brokers for OpenShift as well as the, the Apaches that are on the individual nodes and ensure that the single sign-on modules were installed and working well. And uh, the, the next piece was the deployment. Uh, again, I've, I've talked about this a little bit. We wanted to ensure that our current tools that we have and the new set of tools that are coming up in the environment are able to integrate with OpenShift uh, either via command line or via API to be able to deploy uh, bits to the, the OpenShift um, system. And then uh, all of the other pieces that I talked about, the enterprise databases, the log analytics using um, Splunk in this case, the eStore integration, which is the front end, the single front end for everything uh, that IT does, the, and the enterprise messaging and the web service gateway. So this is a very high level um, architecture, and there's, uh, we, we won't be going into the details around um, how each of these were done, but um, this gives you a snapshot of what we're doing. Um, some of the uh, time that we saved with OpenShift Enterprise was um, the ability to leverage the uh, YUM updating mechanisms for for both the the framework itself and the content provided on it. The use of REST APIs um, so that we could easily integrate with our orchestration tools um, and, and our portal in the front end. And so instead of having to make um, cell scripts and so on that log on to different hosts. Um, the cartridge specification was um, fairly open, uh, although we've had some challenges um, having our developers actually go out and build cartridges, not specifically with um, the cartridge specification itself, but the process that we had to create for them, and we're still working on how to open that up for our developer community. Um, the OSC architecture actually worked well with our thought around, you know, um, multi-tenancy and, and security around multi-tenancy and how it integrates with the larger ecosystem. The, what, what we struggled in our previous, um, our, our larger PaaS environment that I talked about with those 30,000 JVMs was how do you manage idling and scale? And OpenShift provided a, an easy way to manage the idling of uh, idle applications and, and, and scaling and, and using resources more efficiently, right? And then, um, again, out of the box understanding of Jen, um, Get and, and how to use Jenkins. So with that, um, I'll briefly go through some of the um, 
integration, and there's some screenshots that we have. So what you see here is uh, eStore, Cisco IT's implementation of um, Cisco Prime Services Catalog, where um, you, uh, a user will log in and will see a single point of um, entry to order anything that they want in IT. And this particular snapshot that you see is for ordering um, a lightweight application environment, and then after you order the environment, ordering the applications that uh, you may want to develop. And the second screen on this actually shows you um, what the screen looks like to order an application in that environment. So um, there's dev, stays, um, life cycles, um, the size of the application containers that you want, and so on. Right. Um, the second screen actually talks about uh, um, the single sign-on experience that uh, eStore or Cisco Prime Services Catalog provides. As you can see, uh, it's not just cloud-based um, um, services that you can order. Um, you can order pretty much anything that uh, IT provides. And it was crucial for us that this uh, integrate well with the PaaS framework. And, and the APIs that uh, OpenShift provided made it fairly easy for us to do that. The next slide actually talks about um, the Splunk integration. So we wanted, um, we have a Splunk, a fairly large Splunk installation where the providers, uh, in this case Cisco IT infrastructure services, as well as the application developers, both use the platform for their specific needs. A provider may want to look at logs from network devices to uh, operating system logs to um, database logs and so on. And the application developer may want to look at a, um, you know, the, their logs that the application spews out. And we specifically had to create um, um, certain definitions for that, that work well with uh, OpenShift. And I believe those um, add-ons are being added to the Splunk community Site. Um, I, I'll have to check, but um, so so Ruby on Rails, for example, or, or J, JBoss application server, or whatever you may deploy in OpenShift, there were categories created, and we actually looked at how OpenShift um, provides a, a, a UUID for each of those uh, gears in OpenShift parlance. So that application teams, when they come in, they don't know about these UUIDs and, and gear IDs. They know about the application name that they created via Prime Service Catalog. So how do you map that so that when they log into Splunk, they see only the relevant UUID logs? And so uh, there was a quite a bit of work done, and, and uh, it was pretty impressive to see these logs um, being and being available in in Splunk, but not just being available you could actually draw, start drilling down into a specific problem area uh, for an application. Um, and uh, because of the correlation that was built in into the integration with Splunk, you could actually go all the way up to you know your web server logs, for example, and correlate that with the application logs using timestamps and you know, other, other, other correlation fields. Um, so, those are some of the pieces around the integration that we did. Now, um, keep in mind that when we actually did the, the first OpenShift integration, this was with OpenShift 1.2. And um, we're trying to move to 2.1 fairly soon. Um, so what you see here on the roadmap was um, part of the roadmap for, you know, us um, at Cisco to provide these capabilities. Now, with 2.1 and OpenShift, the, a lot of these things are already there. We just have to make sure that we um, it matches with our expectations of, for example, availability zones, um, the regional data centers that we have, um, how do you, um, uh, and so on. So 2.1 2 provides a lot of these. Um, we just have to make sure that it matches. The other three pieces that we're looking at is um, how do you ease the migration of applications from our legacy platforms to OpenShift itself? Uh, a lot of our applications, as I mentioned, are J2E uh, applications. And how do you um, make sure that we, we have a 
fairly easy, um, low resistance path to application teams to migrate from these platforms to OpenShift, which will give them a lot more benefits. Um, as we build out multiple um, locations for OpenShift deployment, uh, we're leveraging Puppet, and we want to leverage Puppet for not just the OpenShift bits, but uh, prepping up the the underlying IaaS stack so that um, you know with with uh, one command or one click of a button you can have uh, a new zone or a new region stood up for OpenShift. Um, OpenStack heat integration, we're, we're moving quite a bit of our workloads from um, a VM-based uh, environment on VMware and ESX to OpenStack um, and KVM. And as we move to create OpenStack-based IaaS, we want to ensure that we can leverage the heat integration. So at this point, um, both the Puppet automation and the heat integration will work hand-in-hand. -hand. Um, heat will provide the orchestration pieces for OpenStack, and um, Heat will, in this case, be calling Puppet scripts uh, behind the scenes. Um, the custom cartridges, as I mentioned, um, there's not been a lot of uptake in, in Cisco IT, at least, um, to create custom cartridges. And, and we need to, and there's probably quite a few factors around that, um, including um, from our side, proper documentation and environments to enable creating of custom cartridges. Um, so that's on our roadmap to kind of ease that path as well. And the last piece is that uh, every, again, as I mentioned, every application team probably has, or our large sets of application teams probably have their own release pipelines, and we want to be able to create um, a system where application teams can define their release pipelines. So some teams may have um, five um, or three, four or five different environments before it gets to production. And they may have gates from one environment, one, one life cycle to another. We should be able to provide that as, as clickable or orderable um, things directly from each store. And we're sort of somewhat there. People can create multiple life cycles for an application already in our current GA environment. But we wanted to add the ability to have gates and so on so that unless you pass a gate, the application doesn't move from one life cycle to another. And the gate could be a variety of things like code reviews and, and so on, right? So this is sort of the roadmap for us um, in the next um, year or so. Um, one thing that I wanted to touch upon was OpenShift provides quite a bit of uh, capabilities in OpenShift Enterprise as part of uh, cartridges that they support. Um, but there's also a lot of cartridges that are available on, in the community side. So we had to uh, kind of come up with a governance model for how we create uh, an environment where people can introduce new capabilities. So um, we came up with this. Uh, Self-managed, community-managed, and IT support-managed uh, um, environments where if, um, if it's out of the box uh, from, from uh, for example, OpenShift Enterprise, um, it's going to be supported mostly on all three. But if it's not out of the box with OpenShift, it might be that um, a particular team wants to use a cartridge. They we make it available, or we make that capability available in our express environment, which is sort of a low SLA environment, and they can manage that cartridge themselves. Um, if there is enough interest uh, from different teams to use that, it moves on to a community support model, and there's specific criteria to get to that. And if there's a business uh, reason for it to be supported by IT, or there's, we feel, IT feels that there's, a valid reasons for supporting the cartridges, then it moves on to an IT managed environment so that IT itself provides, with working with open, uh, Red Hat in this case, provides um, SLAs around support and so on. So, so that was a, um, a model with, that we had to introduce uh, in order to not fully open up the floodgates and, and not know how to do support later on. So I'm almost at the end of the presentation that I had. One thing I wanted to show was um, the adoption metrics. And uh, keep in mind this metrics uh, that I'm showing is actually 
a couple of months old. Um, it's gone up quite a bit. So this was after uh, in, around the March time frame, we released the environment in, uh, I believe, end of January or February. So this was um, sort of the adoption um, without us having to go after different application teams. As you can see, there's quite a bit of uh, uh, interest in PHP and MySQL. P and PHP wasn't an IT-supported um, language runtime before LAE. Uh, Node.js wasn't one either, neither was Ruby or MongoDB. So you can see that it, there's a lot of interest from application developers to use these technologies. And, and the numbers probably have increased quite a bit. I, I wasn't able to pull the numbers um, in time for the webinar. But this shows that there is adoption that's going on without us having to go after application teams. And the last slide here that I have is not, not sort of takeaways, but some notes, right? So one, uh, one thing, and some of these we've provided as feedback to the OpenShift community and, and Red Hat. So availability is, is a big deal for, for a lot of our uh, clients. Um, availability should be uh, all the way down from your routing layer, sorry, your web routing layer to your load balancing, to your application containers, to your databases, and even to your, the IaaS layers. Um, so we need to take that into account when we build OpenShift. Um, and, and OpenShift 2.1 and, uh, and then up, upcoming 2.2 has gone a long way to kind of um, provide that. Um, routing and network security are not uh, some uh, not things that OpenShift provides, uh, and it, it isn't meant to. So the IaaS layers provides uh, network level security, and you need to make sure that you think of those things, network zones and so on. Um, application lifecycle management, um, OpenShift provides hooks. Um, to enable ALM, um, it would be nice to if OpenShift provided ALM capability itself, but maybe it's not the right path that OpenShift will take. Um, there are other vendors and all other open, open source um, solutions that actually provide full ALM. Um, just using OpenShift by itself will probably not work for enterprises. You'll have to think about ALM. Um, the other piece, which is going back to building cartridges, is um, we need to be able to provide OpenShift in a box like a VM. And I think there's something that was released by the OpenShift team. Um, we, we need to have some uptake on that and, and provide that as a capability to our developers. Um, there are add-on cartridges that are non-scalable in OpenShift, so your database cartridges are an example. Um, we'll probably the community will probably need to think about um, creating scalable cartridges for add-on cartridges like databases. Um, region awareness, which is already there in 2.1. Uh, events, there should be an ecosystem of, or a framework to publish all kinds of platform events, not just start, stop, and we should be able to tap into that event um, bus. And I think there's progress in that area in OpenShift. Logging is another area that we did our own integration with um, with um, Splunk, but the new releases of OpenSys um, uh, make a, a single sync available where it's easier to integrate. Um, and again, back to custom cartridges, uh, the downloadable cartridges help here. We're still struggling with the utility of uh, custom cartridges in a, in a typical enterprise setting. There's pockets of areas where custom cartridges are uh, useful for developers directly, but it's mostly the builders, uh, as I was mentioning. And the builders, as opposed to the clients who use these cartridges, are fairly few and far between. So we'll have to figure out how to uh, use the custom cartridges capabilities. So um, with that, I will end my presentation. Um, there's so. Uh, one other thing that um, I want to talk about before I hand it off to Dan was, so the integration that we did in Cisco IT got transferred, uh, a lot of that, those pieces got transferred to our um, systems development unit in, in, in our development organization, which creates validated designs for integrated systems. And there's a CVD design out um, from SDU 
which uh, integrates uh, Red Hat OpenShift with Cisco Prime Service Catalog and deploys it on um, um, you know, Cisco hardware with OpenStack, um, in, this, in this case, Red Hat OpenStack. And that's downloadable um, from the Cisco.com website for people to view. Dan, do you want to take it from here? Okay. Yeah, great. Thank you, Sandy. That was a great overview of what Cisco is doing with OpenShift. Really appreciate you going into all the detail. Um, if uh, for folks on the webinar, if you want to learn more about OpenShift, you can certainly go to OpenShift.com. Um, there's information about OpenShift Enterprise, our private enterprise paths, as well as OpenShift Online, uh, our public hosted paths offering, as well as OpenShift Origin, which is the open source uh, upstream project that's the foundation for all of OpenShift. So. Uh, I've got a couple more slides um, to talk to, and then uh, we'll take some uh, Q&A time. So if you have questions uh, for Sandeep uh, or for me, uh, feel free to put them into the Q&A box uh, on the screen that you can see. Uh, I did want to touch on a couple of additional things uh, in terms of uh, making the most of OpenShift. Um, you're leveraging Red Hat consulting and training. So uh, one of the things that customers like Cisco have done is, is uh, not just purchase the, the OpenShift software, but also taking advantage of our expertise that Red Hat provides around PaaS um, and around DevOps in, in terms of implementing you know, the OpenShift architecture. So there's several different uh, consulting offerings that we have in terms of just a simple introductory getting started with, with OpenShift, uh, more of an enterprise architecture service, uh, as well as advanced services that uh, can get into really designing your, your, your PaaS environment and building out your application lifecycle uh, management environment. In addition, we have uh, trainings and certifications for OpenShift. So uh, we have a number of different classes that are available for, to help you learn how to uh, operate and utilize uh, the OpenShift platform uh, within your organization. And in fact, uh, our training organization is 15 years old, and so we are celebrating that with some discounts, as you can see on the screen here. So uh, discount, save 15% on courses for OpenShift, and that would be a great way to get you jump-started uh, on your uh, OpenShift implementations. So with that, I think we want to thank you. Again, I thank Sandeep uh, for presenting, and we can take a look at some questions now. Um, uh, so as I said before, if you have questions, please feel free to put them into the, into the Q&A box. Um, there's one here initially uh, that's coming in already, uh, Sandeep, and uh, I'll throw it over to you. Uh, what has been the developer reaction to OpenShift uh, within Cisco uh, in, in the reaction to the LAAE environment? Um, so, so developers are actually excited about a, a platform that supports multiple language runtimes. Previously, they had, they had to um, either figure out with IT the support model for it or, or build it on their own and support it themselves. Um, today, OpenShift, or LAE in this case, provides multiple runtimes and they're really excited about that. And the second piece they're excited about is the ability to plug in continuous integration um, into, into their workflows. Okay, cool. Um, and you touched on this briefly, but what were some of the kind of key decision criteria that you had that, that, uh, um, that uh, allowed you to select OpenShift? You know, what, why, why did you choose OpenShift as your past platform instead of some of the other offerings that are out there? Sure, and I'll briefly switch back to uh, a slide. Um, or, you know, it's available there. In, in slide 11, I talk about the seven different criteria buckets. Um, and, and the different um, criteria inside those buckets. OpenShift seemed to fit those criteria really well. Uh, open source, um, polyglot, and, and a few other things. Um, and uh, yeah, there you go. Um, and again, the, it was not just the, that OpenShift fit the criteria, it was also the roadmap uh, that we saw from OpenShift around where they're going with this. Um, and it fit our, our general direction really well. Okay. All right. Let me look at uh, there's some more questions coming in here. Um, how long did it take uh, for Cisco to, uh, to roll out the paths uh, from concept to roll out? So uh, we actually started in, our, I guess, uh, late or mid-2012 with and this was not specific to OpenShift. This was how, how do we provide the next generation of application uh, environments to our uh, clientele. Um, so started around 2012 and then went through the, the 
specifications and, and what we needed, the requirements and so on, and then choosing uh, a different um, products to work with, settling on a product. So it took about a year and a half to get to uh, an express environment in, using OpenShift, and then maybe about almost two years to get to uh, a fully supported GA environment. But that's not just for PaaS, that's the entire life cycle of how we want to provide applications. Um, yep, that was it. Okay. Um, here's one that I'll take. Uh, in the case of Java apps, does OpenShift support frameworks, uh, Spring, Hibernate, et cetera? Um, and then maybe partly for you too, Sandy, did you face this at Cisco? Uh, and the answer is yes, OpenShift does support uh, Spring and Hibernate. Uh, essentially anything that, that runs in, in Java on, uh, will, will be able to run within OpenShift. So the Spring uh, libraries are, are supported um, within the JBoss Enterprise application platform as well as uh, you know, uh, other options within just plain Java within OpenShift. Um, did, did you guys work with Spring and Hibernate uh, at Cisco? Um, yes, um, Spring and, and Hibernate and, and regular GAT as well. Um, it depends on the application team, so we don't provide a specific guidance as to which one to use. Right, yeah. that's true. Yeah, OpenShift is one of the, one of the only open source private PaaS platforms uh, uh, for on-premise use that supports full, the full Java e, uh, E6 container uh, as well as the Spring uh, libraries. Um, can you name a few of the custom cartridges that Cisco has developed uh, for your for your OpenShift environment? Sure. So um, one of the larger Z2E environments that we're working with is um, WebSphere, as well as um, um, another environment is WebLogic. Um, so we will build our own paths around those environments, and today. We're looking at if we can provide a cartridge for the WebLogic pieces um, so that the, the start, stop, provisioning, et cetera, is managed by OpenShift, but we use the, the J2E capabilities of um, WebLogic. That's one area. The other is uh, something that we're working on to provide Jabber XMPP-based um, cartridges, cartridges for application development using XMPP. Um, Again, back to what I was saying earlier, these are provided by the, the Cisco IT infrastructure services themselves, not by application developers, and we need to enable the developers to build their own cartridges, and that's on the roadmap. Okay. Yeah, and incidentally, you, you've mentioned this in your talk, but there are a number of cartridges that are up on, in, in the open source community, uh, cartridges for OpenShift. So they're up on GitHub uh, within the kind of the OpenShift area on GitHub. And one of those is actually a cartridge uh, that one of our other customers built uh, for running WebLogic on, on top of OpenShift. So that may get you a head start there as you guys look at the uh, at running WebLogic uh, in the OpenShift environment. Yep. Um, Here's another question, Sandeep. Which other PaaS vendors did you uh, did Cisco compare versus OpenShift? Oh, um, yeah, I didn't particularly put that on the slides, but um, there were actually quite a few different uh, products that we looked at, both um, off-prem and on-prem. Um, the on-prem, uh, the off-prem um, uh, solutions were things like Google App Engine, um, Heroku, and um, um, you know Amazon's Beanstalk. Off-prem by itself did not fit our needs. On-prem, we actually looked at things like Cloud Foundry, OpenShift, Staccato, um, even Cloudify, and and what fit our needs mostly was, again, nothing to do with OpenShift or, or, or Cloudify or anything like that. It, it just had to fit our thinking around where we're taking paths, um, and OpenShift fit the bill, as I uh, talked about earlier. OK. Um, all right, here's a, an interesting question. Can you clarify again, uh, it's actually showing on this slide here, um, the three roles that you identified, builder, provider, and subscriber, and, and how you, uh, what, what those sure. roles are in your organization? Sure, so so in, in the case of um, a lightweight application environment um, using OpenShift, the provider is Cisco IT uh, global infrastructure, or cities, right? So they build the environment and um, provide ordering and, and all of that stuff. Subscriber are the people who actually come in and order the services on LAE. So I need a, a Ruby cartridge or, or a Ruby application or whatever. The builder are the ones who provide additional capabilities to add on to LAE. So 
Um, one example is cartridges that are needed. Those are built by a separate team of builders. In this case, the provider itself could be a builder, but we are on the path of enabling the developers themselves to be builder roles. And so we create an ecosystem of um, capabilities where the builder itself provides SLAs and the provider just hosts them. Um, so cartridges are one example. The Splunk integration is another example where a builder actually creates the, the Splunk integration capability and provider takes that and says, okay, I like that and I will use that in my environment. And um, the provider itself cannot scale to do all of the building and that's why we're trying to separate out the roles so that if some other person, some other group can do the bu the building of the capabilities. Okay. If that makes sense. Yep. Um, Thank you. Here's a, another question that's come in. Does Cisco have a C++ or .NET environment that would need to be leveraged uh, in a PaaS environment? Um, Cisco does have C++, not in our typical IT um, application portfolio, mostly on the engineering side. Um, we also have .NET, um, not to the extent probably, I, I, I would venture, I guess, maybe 5% of the applications. And they're not typically IT supported in the sense that IT supports the, the infrastructure pieces, the Windows runtime and so on, but the applications uh, are supported by the application team themselves. So not so much a need to support um, C++ and, and .NET. Um, in LA in the near term, but as as LA expands out, the, it's it's a it's a possibility. Okay. Um, and here's another question: Can you say something about the chargeback model used for your paths? Uh, and, and I guess one question sure. is: Are you doing? Are you using the chargeback model for your departments? Um, we actually use currently the showback model. Um, more than the chargeback model. So there's a, a, a process that uh, application teams go through to secure funds for whatever projects they're working on. And as, um, as new resources are ordered from um, the e-store catalog, these are deducted from, from the allocated funds. So that's one way. The other way is there's a large pool of um, the resources available for, for an entire org, and we show back at the end of the, uh, the, the week, the quarter, the, the year, how much of the resources they're using. So we're, as far as Starzak and Sobek, we're still on that journey around um, figuring out the best way to, um, you know, uh, have accountability for costs. Okay. Uh, have you considered using centralized modules for various functions like logging, audit tracking, monitoring, tools automation, business process orchestration, rules engine, et cetera? Um, certain pieces, yes. So for uh, logging, authentication certainly makes sense in an IT environment. Um, other pieces like business rules engines um, may not make sense um, because not all rules engines are built equally and we, you know, and and the use cases for, for example, BREs for different application teams may be different. So we're probably not going to provide, um, you know, rules engines and things like that centrally, unless you know. Again, we'll we'll speak to the clients if they if we see the clients come in um, and ask for the same set of capabilities, we'll evaluate that and and look at providing that centrally. Hmm. Okay. There's been several questions coming in around training, um, and the training information is available on our website, uh, either redhat.com or openshift.com. Uh, but we can also, I'll, I'll reach out to uh, the folks individually um, after the webinar and provide you with links to the, to the appropriate information. Um, and here's one last question. I think we're almost at the top of the hour. Um, Sandeep, can you talk about the um, the integration with the TIBCO uh, service bus that you've done with, with OpenShift? Yeah, so when I mentioned TIBCO service bus, we have a, a fairly large installation of different pieces of the TIBCO ecosystem. So there's a messaging middleware using um, JMS-based infra. So that was the primary piece. Uh, applications using um, JMS, our, we call that environment MMX, uh, messaging middleware. 
uh, applications being developed using uh, OpenShift need to be able to talk to existing applications that leverage um, JMS-based queues and topics. So I shouldn't need to go download JMS libraries and make sure it works. So that should be available directly uh, in my OpenShift runtime environment, and that's the integration that we did. Okay. All right, good. Well, I think we're at the top of the hour. I appreciate everybody's atten attendance. We've had a great turnout today and um, lots of questions. We don't, I don't think we got to every question, um, but we will follow up via email for those that uh, weren't answered live here on the webinar. Uh, the webinar will be available um, as a on-demand recording. Uh, you can access any time. Um, also, your colleagues can still register and view the on-demand recording uh, after the fact as well. Um, and we will also be... Um, we're providing another webinar in August. Let me get to the link for that. And you're welcome to attend um, attend that our next webinar and learn more about OpenShift and PaaS and, and the kind of real-world implementations that we're seeing customers do. So again, thank you for your time. We'll wrap up the webinar at this point, and uh, have a great uh, day and week.